And welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Utilizing Heart Rate Variability for Preclinical Evaluation of Cardiovascular Function and Related Disease. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific, and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Data Sciences International, and will focus on the utility of heart rate variability as a preclinical tool for studying both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular related diseases in small and large animal models, using wireless implantable telemetry. First, we will hear from Emma Carey, who will discuss how to distill autonomic function from rodent ECG telemetry recordings, supported through research conducted in Dr. Chow Yin Chen's laboratory at the University of California, Davis. Specifically, Emma will discuss how to identify and interpret the physiological significance of HRV in conscious freely moving rodents, how to obtain clean ECG recordings for downstream HRV analysis using data insight software functions, and how reductions in HRV can reflect cardiac dysfunction in rodent models that are caused, at least in some part, by changes in the cardiac vagal inputs to the SA node. Following, John Woolard, Principal Research Technologist from the Lilac Lerman Research Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic, We'll present a case study involving a swine model of human disease related to renovascular dysfunction and metabolic syndrome. Specifically, he will share laboratory methodology, best practices, and share preliminary data showing the value of heart rate variability as it relates to the investigation of metabolic dysfunction and hypercholesterolemia. Hi, so good morning. Um, just a disclosure, uh, you will see a little rat in my picture here, and we do some telemetry data with rat recordings, um, but the data I'm presenting today will exclusively be uh, for mice. Uh, however, we have also validated this method in uh, a rat as well. So for those of you interested in rats, it sounds like there's a lot of you here. Okay. So today I plan to talk about the physiological significance of heart rate variability, um, the regulation of heart rate and heart rate variability, and how comparable they are between rodents and humans. Some challenges that I have encountered uh, with rodent models of heart rate variability, which have to do often with the quality of the recordings, quality of the data or simply the quantity of the data and then some experimental applications because I am a PhD student and I am interested in sort of the scientific endeavors as well. So heart rate variability or HRV as you will see abbreviated uh, throughout the duration of this talk is an index of autonomic function. It's associated with many diseases including those that are neurological in origin like depression metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases like heart failure and hypertension. For the duration of this talk, I'm gonna focus primarily on cardiovascular outcomes, uh, not only because that's what our lab is interested in, but because one in four deaths in the United States are attributed to heart disease, and it has been shown epidemiologically that a decrease in heart rate variability is an independent risk factor for an increased risk of arrhythmias and an increased risk of death from sudden cardiac death. So when talking about heart rate variability and looking at ECG waveforms, which we'll get to in a second, there's really one criterion that is what has to be considered when doing this analysis, and that's the inclusion of only normal to normal RR intervals, which means you can't have arrhythmias, you can't have missed beats, artifacts, noise, anything like that. And when I talk about heart rate variability, there are several uh, mathematical parameters you can derive. So let's talk about what those parameters are first. So here you'll see a representative waveform we've gotten from our mouse recordings. I would like to point out, I'm gonna use my cursor as a, a mouse so you can see. Uh, this is not a continuous recording. You can see we do have some data breaks here, but uh, much of the data I will talk about today is from continuous recordings. So here's a representative ECG waveform. And you have your RR intervals. And again, that R wave is going to be that sharp peak in the QRS complex. And you can see that we've just listed are our intervals in increasing order just numerically. And if we take all of the ECG uh, data that we have and we take all of the RR intervals within that ECG, we can drive a couple of overall heart rate variability parameters. And these are gonna be the SDNN or the standard deviation of all of the normal to normal RR intervals in your data set. And you can also uh, determine the coefficient of variance. And that's important because it normalizes for any change changes in your baseline heart rate. 
But sometimes you want to look at your data a little bit differently, and so you can break your ECG recordings up into two-minute batches. And this is nice because it gives you more of an intermediate heart rate variability window. And so this, from these two-minute segments, you can derive a couple different parameters, including the SDANN, or the standard deviation of all of the averages of the normal RR intervals within a two-minute segment. You can also determine the SDNNIDX, which is just the mean of those standard deviations of all the RR intervals in that same two-minute segment. Additionally, you can look at beat-to-beat -beat changes in heart rate variability, or short-term or instantaneous heart rate variability. And this is really just looking at the standard deviation of the delta change between adjacent heartbeats. And this is your RMSSD, or your root mean squared of your successive difference. But this is really math and jargon heavy, and that's not my favorite thing to talk about. And so I try and really link it back to the physiological significance of what these values and what these parameters tell us. So as I mentioned, you have overall intermediate and short-term heart rate variability. And these actually tell us about different things that the body is doing. So if we're talking about that overall variability, we're talking about both arms of the autonomic regulation, both your vagal and sympathetic inputs, as well as your humoral factors, and really anything that the animal is doing. So if it's resting, if it's grooming, if it's eating, if it's running around, all of those things will be embedded in that overall heart rate variability data. If you're looking at intermediate heart rate variability, this is really giving you this on a two to two, no, I'm sorry, on a two minute uh, segment basis, it's giving you more of that uh, autonomic regulation and sort of balance uh, part of the equation. So you're really seeing sort of just the vagal and sympathetic uh, contributions to that variability. And if you look at that short-term variability or that RMSSD, that's really reflective of that vagal uh, contribution to heart rate variability regulation. So as you can see, you can determine a lot of important physiological parameters simply from looking at the data in a couple different ways. So uh, I'm going to there's been some contention in the field um, in terms of how good rodent models are for heart rate variability. And that's because we know that humans are a vagal dominant species. And it's been presumed that uh, rodents are a sympathetically dominant species. And that is often due to how their heart rate is regulated. Several years ago in my lab, we did a study to sort of confirm that we could use these animals for heart rate variability downstream analysis. So these graphs that you're looking at now are called tachygrams, and what you're looking at is adjacent RR intervals over time on the x-axis, and you can see your RR, I'm sorry, your RR interval on your y-axis. And we had four groups. So we had a vehicle control, we had an atenolol group, which is a sympathetic antagonist, we had a methyl atropine group, which is going to be your vagal blocker, and then we blocked both arms of the autonomic nervous system with a methyl atropine and atenolol group together. So you will see these tachograms come up again, so I just wanted to introduce you to what these are and what they look like. And so we gave an injection of these drugs, and then we looked at the percent change from baseline, I'm sorry, in these animals. And so as you can see, uh, even in the vehicle, we see a percent change from baseline in our RR interval. And so you can see that the RR interval gets a little bit shorter, which makes sense because then your heart rate is increasing, and that's just a a consequence of stressing the animal out from giving them an injection. This was a transient effect and it actually was non, not significant um, statistically. So if you pay attention to the data to the right, you can see that when you give a sympathetic blocker, you see an increase in the percent change from baseline. This increase in your RR interval means your heart rate is slowing down, which makes sense when you're blocking the sympathetic or excitatory part of the autonomic system. If you look at our vagal data, when we block with methyl atropine, you see a percent decrease in your um, RR interval, which again corresponds to an increase in your heart rate, which again makes sense. But when we block them together, you again see that this, these data basically mimic the sympathetic blocker alone, which suggests that heart rate is in fact a sympathetically dominated characteristic in mice. However, when we look at the various parameters of heart rate variability in these same groups, and again, we have our SDNN, which is our overall. Our SDANN is a reflection of intermediate, and RMSSD is our short-term variability. You can see that when you give a sympathetic blocker, you do see a decrease in your uh, percent change from baseline and your heart rate variability in all of these parameters. But that effect is greater when you give a vagal blocker. And when you give them together, those data basically mimic exactly what you see with just the vagal block alone. And this is especially true when you look just at your RMSSD or that vagal uh, sort of 
contribution to heart rate variability. So these data support that heart rate variability in mice is in fact a vagal dominated characteristic, which means that we can use them for this analysis. So hopefully I've convinced you that rodents are actually an appropriate model for heart rate variability. But when you're using rodent models, there are some inherent challenges that you don't face with humans. Um, and these factors are often influencing how accurate your data, your data are. And these include the quality of the recordings themselves, so the fidelity of these ECG waveforms, or the quality of the data in terms of you have no control over your subject. So oftentimes heart rate variability data in humans is taken when the human is seated and their respiration is controlled. Uh, rodents are non-stationary. They breathe whenever they want, and so that is an inherent challenge. And just the quantity of the data is overwhelming. So as many of you know, rodents uh, have about 600 heartbeats per minute. So that equates to about 860,000 heartbeats per day. Our lab does often 36 hours of continuous recording. So we're talking over a million heartbeats that we're dealing with per animal per time point. So it's just an overwhelming amount of data to work through. And some heart rate variability parameters are more sensitive to noise than others. And so this uh, schematic should look very familiar to you again, where you just see your overall intermediate and short term. But I have actually found that uh, the short term variability or that vagal contribution is the most sensitive to noise, which makes sense because you're looking at beat to beat changes in heart rate variability compared to overall. So if you have a lot of uh, noise here, but you have other sort of contributing factors, including behavioral ones, it may get sort of mass and you won't necessarily notice that effect. Um, again, I would just like to point out these are time domain parameters. Um, I know John is going to talk about some frequency domain data, and I would just like to highlight that as sensitive to noise as our short-term uh, time domain heart rate variability is, you could imagine then that the frequency domain would actually be to the right of that. So it's actually more sensitive to noise than even the short-term heart rate variability in the time domain. So we will not uh, go into that for the purposes of this talk. So as I mentioned, you have close to a million heartbeats a day. You have to, you can only include normal to normal RR intervals. How do you clean up your data? And the gold standard is to hand clean, which is as tedious and awful as it sounds. Um, it's traditionally what our lab has done and it takes a team of often 10 people years to get papers out and it's, it's not desirable. Um, but so that's the gold standard that we've been using. And so uh, I'm just gonna walk you guys through how these next several slides will be laid out. In blue, you will see all data. So these will be 12 hours of uh, ECG recordings from the dark cycle of a mouse. Um, and this is if we just sort of run a very simplistic analysis attributes settings on our data in Panema. It marks them sort of it marks all the data the same and then we we run some downstream analysis from that so these will be the same in all of the slides and you will see them in blue um, and so again this is just a tachygram here what you will see on the upper right corner is the probability of the distribution of these rr intervals so you see again the probabilities on your y-axis with your r interval length on your x and this is on a log scale just be aware and on the bottom right what you will see is a lorenz plot so this is going to be the rr interval on the x-axis uh, mapped against the RR interval plus one or the adjacent RR interval. So this gives you sort of a nice visualization of the distribution of the data. So when I say we hand clean the data, we have some undergrads who work tirelessly and they eliminate all the data that we deem to be not normal. And as you can see, what happens is, first of all, we get a different scale here entirely. So this is, we're on a 5,000 um, to zero scale here. We're on 500 to zero milliseconds on the bottom. And you get this nice clustering of your data. Now, if we superimpose this on all of our data, you can see that all of that data is still down at the bottom, but we have a lot of blue dots, which we really don't want to include in our analysis. If we look at how that data is mapped against the probability previously, you can see we're still catching all of those RR intervals that are, are mostly included, but likely eliminating the ones that are out to the right and left. And if you look at the Lorenz plot, you can see that this, our data really sort of cluster to this area here and, and everything else is something we don't wanna include. So I'm gonna blow this up so it's easier to see. And what you can hopefully appreciate is that we get this clustering of real data here and everything in blue would be sort of contributing to inappropriate uh, interpretation of our data downstream. But like I said, 
hand cleaning is incredibly tedious and most labs are not interested in spending that much time. So people are always looking for ways to be more efficient. And so one of the published methods that has been um, accepted and, and performed is to take two standard deviations, so you've that's that 2SD you're seeing here, from the mean of the, uh, so your average RR interval and two standard deviations above and below, and then it's been sort of agreed upon that you're you're getting all the data that's real and you're eliminating a lot of the bad data and that's likely good enough. So uh, we did that just as a to comparison for our hand clean. So here's going to be our mean and our uh, standard deviation from the mean. So we would take two above and below. And here this red bracket would just sort of show you where that data would fall. So if we cut off our data with these numerics, as you can see, we have this sort of artificial negative number because you can't have uh, an RR interval below zero milliseconds. Um, but you see, again, this clustering in the middle, which is likely that real data that we got in our cleaned up file. And then you get a lot of these data uh, RR intervals that are either noise or artifact or something that are getting included simply because they fall within this numeric cutoff. If we superimpose that on the uh, all the data that we started with, you can see it, we get a little bit of a thicker line, and so we're, we're including a little bit more data, but again, it's really hard to tell how good of a job we're doing. So if we look at the probability distribution here, you can see that, again, we're keeping all of the RR intervals that are we want, and everything else is getting cut off, so that seems okay. And again, we are going to make those numeric cutoffs with these brackets. The data that we're interested in is in this lower left corner here. I'm going to blow that up so you guys can see. And what you're hopefully able to appreciate is that no, you're no longer just getting that clean data here in the center, but you're actually getting all of this data to the sort of corners, which again, we know is not normal to normal. So already it's violating the criterion or the only criterion that we're using for heart rate variability uh, inclusion analysis. So we thought maybe there has to be a better way. We want to get more accurate. We want to be, we want to be able to make appropriate uh, interpretations of our data. And so we teamed up with uh, DSI and started using their software Data Insights because the advantage of this software is that because you have marked data, you can then, instead of using a hard numeric cutoff, which has been the limitation previously, you can say, I wanna look for a percent change from the previous beat as a uh, inclusion criteria. And we've uh, decided on using 20%. And so if we said if the if the RR interval before or after was greater or less in terms of the difference from the previous, by more than 20%, we did not want to include that. And this has been confirmed. Um, we've, we found at least um, consistency in the clinical data because a lot of physicians will say when they're looking at human heart rate variability or human ECGs, if they see a, a waveform that is more than 20% difference from the previous, they actually will exclude that as well. So we have some consistency with clinical data as well. So again, here's all your data. And here's gonna be our 20% cutoff data that we obtained with Data Insights. And as you can see, it's really nice and clustered. We don't have any sort of weird noise or uh, inappropriate R waves included. We're gonna map that again against all of our data. And you can see we're eliminating basically all of this data that or all of these R waves we're not interested in. We're still keeping those data and those R waves that we are interested in. And again, we're getting this clustering down here, which I'll blow up for you. And as you can see, again, we're getting that nice sort of isolated profile of RR intervals and none of this um, sort of, well, we, we don't know the source of it necessarily, but none of that data we're not interested in. So here's just sort of a side-by-side -side comparison of these heart rate variability cleanup parameters by method. So here's all of our data, again, just on that 500 to zero scale, so everything is the same. And as you can see with your heart rate variability parameters, here are those overall intermediate and short-term heart rate variability uh, downstream parameters I mentioned. So if we look at that hand clean data, as you can see, there are some parameters that are more sensitive to this noise uh, than others. And so you will see that your SDNN is greatly affected in your overall variability, but some of your intermediate, which again, these are determined from sort of two minute averages and standard deviations of the averages. And so they may be a little more protected from some of these uh, inappropriate R waves. But we look at this RMSSD, that short-term heart rate variability, and we see a dramatic uh, ability to detect what we believe to be the real short-term heart rate variability compared to what we would have gotten if we had not cleaned up our data at all. So if we look at that two standard deviation method, 
what you can see is that, again, this has been published. People do use this. Our SDNN, that overall variability, is pretty close to that hand clean data. So one might look at that and say, yep, I'm convinced that works for me. Even some of these intermediate parameters look not too far off. But what you do see is in the short term heart rate variability is that you're starting to get uh, values for your RMSSD, which I have not seen um, in rodents. So I don't believe these to be physiologically possible or at least true. And if we look at that 20% cutoff, what you can see is that, again, you're getting some consistency all of a sudden across your parameters, very similar to the hand clean. And in fact, it in some cases is actually lower than the hand clean. And this may actually be an advantage to using the software because when you're doing hand cleaned, you're relying on your eye to catch anything that's wrong. And the eye is very good at catching patterns and looking and finding arrhythmias and you know, erroneously marked R waves, but the data insight software by using a percent cutoff can actually detect if we say 20% versus 22%. And so it actually is, I think, a little more rigorous in terms of what it excludes. And we may actually be catching what is really more of the real appropriate data instead of some of those ones that are right on the cutoff that visually we missed. So again, just to point out, we're getting a nice consistency between what is what we consider the gold standard for heart rate variability cleanup and in this 20% cutoff method using data insights. And just to sort of reiterate why this is so important for us, uh, the data I've presented is 12 hours of mouse ECGs, which is about 430,000 heartbeats per animal. And so to do a hand clean data set of this size conservatively, would take 12 to 20 hours in a good day. And to do the same analysis on the same amount of data with data insights, we're talking about an hour of cleanup. And so that's a significant time savings for us. And we're, we're very excited about sort of the opportunities for this. It really improves our efficiency and data throughput. Um, so hopefully you guys stayed with me through the, the methods aspect of this and this optimization. Um, but as a scientist, I'm really interested in sort of mechanisms underlying dysfunction and so we do all of this these method optimizations to be able to really ask important questions and so our lab is primarily interested in how exposure to air pollution changes cardiovascular health including the mechanisms underlying pollution induced changes in heart rate variability and so here you can see a representative tachygram from an animal exposed to filtered air so this would look familiar to you you see these nice swings you see this variability you can visually see it when you look at enough of it and here is a tachogram from a mouse exposed to secondhand smoke. And hopefully what you can see just visually is you see this blunted uh, heart, uh, tachogram where you, you don't really get those swings in the RR intervals anymore. Now these mice were exposed to a pretty high concentration of smoke for three days. And as you can see, we looked at heart rate, which is the inverse of the RR interval. And we looked at our heart rate variability parameters. And you saw a decrease in all three of these after three days of exposure. Um, and these, I like, I'm sorry, I meant, I meant to uh, say this. So these animals were compared to filtered air control. So we compare our smoking mice to our filtered air mice. And on the fourth day, we were interested in whether or not, as a result of having reduced heart rate variability, whether or not they were more likely to uh, have arrhythmias. And so we had to induce arrhythmias in these animals. And what we found is that in filtered air animals, we were unable to induce arrhythmias of ventricular or atrial origin or conduction origin. So no AV blocks were able to be uh, produced. But in our secondhand smoking mice, we were able to induce all three types of arrhythmias to varying extents. And this is nice because this supports that argument that I mentioned earlier that a reduction in heart rate variability serves as an independent risk factor for an increased risk of arrhythmias. Um, but our lab is also interested in the mechanisms underlying this. So how do we, as a result of air pollution, get a reduction in heart rate variability? And so here's another study that our lab did. Here's again a filtered air tachygram. You're seeing some, some nice swings in your R interval that looks pretty variable compared to, this is a PM 2.5, so particulate matter, and a, another study that we did you can see a blunted tachogram here. And these, again, were exposed for three days. And compared to the filtered air controls, we saw a reduction in all three of our heart rate variability parameters. Now, our lab, as I mentioned, is interested in the upstream mechanisms of this. And we are particularly interested in the vagal inputs to the SA node and how they may be changing the uh, activity of the heart. And so we know that the vagal neurons that uh, give inputs to the SA node 
exist in the nucleus ambiguous, which is here in the NA region of the brainstem, and they project to the heart. And so our lab does some electrophysiological techniques. We can take brain slices and do whole cell patch clamping, and we can look at sort of the excitability of these cells. And so what we did is we took some cells in the nucleus ambiguous and we patched onto them and we injected them with an increasing current injection protocol. And so as you can see, when you inject them with a current, you see a spiking response indicating that they are depolarized, they are firing. And so just to sort of summarize quickly, what we found is that with these air pollution exposures, we see a reduction in the spiking response in animals exposed to uh, particulate matter compared to their filtered air controls. And this supports the argument that if the vagal inputs to the heart are blunted, that that might explain why we see a reduced heart rate variability in these animals because we know that they're vaguely dominated in terms of heart rate variability regulation. So this also fits nicely with some of the um, sort of epidemiological data that we have. So to summarize, uh, hopefully I've convinced you of the physiological significance and uh, of heart rate variability and how it is regulated, and that it's actually a very important index of autonomic function, and that rodents make pretty good models for heart rate variability. And in vivo, uh, we have been able to match clinical data in terms of reduced heart rate variability and arrhythmia inducibility, and a reduction in neuronal excitability in terms of the inputs to the SA node, suggesting that we have some shared autonomic mechanisms with with humans. And as I mentioned, there are obviously challenges with working with rodent models. And it's been this sort of cost benefit of do we do we sacrifice precision and accuracy for efficiency? And then we have decided that a 20% cutoff seems to eliminate enough of the bad data that we are able to make appropriate uh, interpretations of our data for downstream analysis. And so with that, I would just like to thank our lab. As you guys know, nothing in science is an individual endeavor. And so uh, Chow, my PI, as well as my uh, postdoc soon, and then my lab mate June. And then as I mentioned, we have an amazing undergraduate team who works tirelessly for absolutely no money. They are awesome. Um, and they are pictured in one of these two pictures here, as well as our uh, collaborators and uh, DSI, the tech support team, and Jennifer Doyle, and our funding support. Thank you, Andy, and thank you for letting me uh, talk about some of our research that we are uh, working on. I'm going to talk about the uh, prospective study on how uh, hypercholesterolemia might have uh, an impact on heart rate variability in a preclinical model of swine. Um, and for full disclosure, part the the following study and, and information that I'll be presenting was partially supported by Recombinetics Incorporated in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Dan, Daniel F. Carlson uh, was, is employed by Recombinetics. A brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna give a sh short introduction to heart rate variability, talk a little bit about um, our preclinical, uh, one of our preclinical swine models, share some of our results that we've looked at on, our, on the longitudinal data analysis we've done so far, and then summarize what we found at the, up to now. So a little bit about heart rate variability, and Emma's done an excellent job of talking about it already. Um, but HRV is a measure of the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic autonomic activity. And um, What's been shown uh, shown in the past is that decreased HRV can be a uh, indicator of abnormal dominance of the sympathetic activity. It's also been shown in, in humans, especially, that uh, decreased HRV leads to increased cardiovascular. So it's a risk factor, and it's also been observed in the presence of uh, cardiovascular disease, heart failure in patients by epidemiological studies, and it's related to, can be related to the incidence and severity of ischemic heart disease. Um, it's also been associated, it's also been associated with hypercholesterolemia in cross-sectional studies of human subjects, and, um, but uh, we know that that's, uh, again, epidemiological and causal causation is, is definitely unclear, mostly because it's difficult to do long-term studies with patients. So there may or may be a consequence of hypercholesterolemia um, in, in this association, or it could be some other phenomena that also might be contributing. 
So what we were interested in in our, the goal of our initial study here was to look at and prospectively collect data on whether or not diet-induced hypercholesterolemia could longitudinally impair heart rate variability in a preclinical model. And that might allow us to have a better understanding between this uh, scene and an associated link in uh, hypercholesterolemia and heart rate variability to help manage and improve risk prevention in patients that do have HC. So our underlying hypothesis was that progressive hypercholesterolemia would lead to a decreased heart rate variability in our preclinical swine model. And what is the swine model we're working with? Well, we are working with a model of, of a miniature pig called the Asabal, which is already an animal that is known to be predisposed to metabolic syndrome when fed um, a hypercholesterolemia or, or an H high fat diet. And the, our partners in, in Recombinetics wanted to look at whether or not adding a gain of function mutation in the PCSK9 gene would make the animals even more prone to hypercholesterolemia and how that would affect, uh, uh, could affect um, various parameters within the animal when fed an atherogenic diet on top of it. It's well known that PCSK9 plays a role in the clearance of LDL cholesterol through the degradation of the hepatic receptor and elevated PCSK9 leads to uh, hepatocyte LDL uptake and also increases, therefore, the plasma um, levels of LDL. So we took our animals and we had four groups of animals. We had two uh, gain-of-function animals and we have animals who are wild type. And each group of uh, each two of those groups were fed either a normal diet or a high fat diet, and then those will be labeled later as both ND for normal diet and HFD for high fat diet. This diet is a high fat, high cholesterol, high carbohydrate diet, very similar to the the current Western diet um, linked to, especially linked to uh, the eating of high quantities of fast food. So our, our experimental groups are in this table. We have both of our wild type groups, the normal diet and the high fat diet. We had four and three animals in each of those groups respectively, as well as the PCSK9 gain of function animals fed the normal and the high fat diet, each with five animals per group. Now the diet was started at three months of age and was continued for three months. So these animals are relatively young at the start of the study. Our animals were implanted with a femoral artery telemetry transmitter, the model L11 Physiotel Digital. And uh, all the pigs had that replanted into their femoral artery uh, to record blood pressure, temperature, and activity. I will note here that we did not collect ECG data directly. Um, the animals were implanted either at baseline when they were received at three months of age, or one of our groups, on for, uh, due to logistics, was started on study with the uh, uh, telemetry transmitter at three months, and that was our wild type normal group. The animals were studied um, and identified at baseline three months and six months of age for their uh, telemetry information, as well as at three months and six months, we did in vivo imaging and blood uh, collections were performed. Now our assessment of heart rate variability was, of course, because we did not do ECG analysis uh, in implantation of our animals, we utilized our uh, blood pressure waveform data to calculate our normal to normal beat speed interval utilizing the Planema uh, software system. And we did do two different types of analysis. Uh, we did both a time domain analysis similar to what uh, Emma focused on, but we also did a frequency domain analysis. And we looked at those in parallel together to help us to uh, identify and look at our, the heart rate variability in our animals. Now from this blood pressure data, 
we computed a number of uh, parameters. The first was heart rate. It was computed over 72 hours around the time point of baseline three and six months of diet, around those times of imaging at three months and six months. And then utilizing those same 72 hours of data, we computed our HRV data, and that was computed at five minute intervals. Um, utilizing five minute intervals allow, gives us a larger number of uh, beats uh, to analyze, simply because uh, the large animal has a much lower heart rate in comparison to a mouse, for example. We standardized our readings. We did try to minimize the effect of non-stationary data. Uh, and we did some of that by excluding the data segments that had greater than 5% anomalies within the software and excluded data segments that had uh, or were associated with heart rates of less than 30 beats per minute or greater than 200 beats per minute. And all of these, this information, these parameters were selected due to uh, previously published uh, reports in by Van Borel et al. and Circulation in 1996. Those are based on farm animal recommendations since we are working with a uh, swine model. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the two different analyses that we did. So starting with the frequency domain analysis, from the NN uh, intervals, we looked at the uh, frequency bins um, and those frequency bins were both low frequency, that will be labeled LF later, and high frequency HF later. And all these bins were selected again based on previous work that was done in farm animal recommendations. So the low frequency was from 0 to 0 0.09 hertz, and the high frequency bin was assigned at 0 0.09 hertz to 2 hertz. We also wanted to look at the, uh, the power distribution of the frequency analysis. So we did and looked at and calculated the power distribution ratio of the low frequency to the high frequency domain. Mostly because this is associated with, uh, increased values of this ratio are associated with sympathetic dominance. So you will see later on um, LF to HF ratios as part of our data. For the time domain analysis, we calculated some parameters that were very similar to what Emma has uh, talked about previously. We looked at, and again, these were NN intervals averaged over five minutes. Um, we looked at the uh, standard deviation of the NN intervals, and we also looked at the square root of the mean of sum of squares differences between adjacent intervals, or the RMSSD. We also calculated two other uh, uh, parameters related to time domain analysis based upon some of our uh, uh, reading of the literature. We looked at the PNN 50, which is associated with values, uh, increased values are associated with normal heart rate variability. And that's calculated by the number of adjacent intervals differing by more than 50 milliseconds divided by the total number of intervals in, in that five minute interval. And we also looked at the ratio of SDNN to RMSSD as that can be a, uh, associated with sympathetic dominance, specifically increased values of that ratio. So we will be looking at all four of those parameters in the time domain. Also looked at and um, did some systemic measurements. So of course we looked at the mean arterial pressure over that 72 hour time frame for our HRV analysis. We looked at the blood lipid panels to help us so that we could calculate the LDL. Um, those are calculated LDL values from the total cholesterol, HDL, and triglyceride data that it was obtained from the plasma. And of course, we did have body weight measurements at each time point. I'll be focusing, however, my results from systemic on the heart rate values and the cholesterol levels uh, from the animals. So you, as you can see here, um, the total cholesterol and the LDL values that were calculated from the lipid panels at baseline three months and six months. On the left is the total cholesterol, and it's well known that um, LDL calculated values are gonna be directly related to the total cholesterol. Um, 
we did see some nice significant differences, which was uh, expected between our animal groups, specific, especially at the six month time point. The uh, PCSK9 high fat diet animals were greatly elevated in both total cholesterol and low LDL cholesterol when compared to all the other three groups. And in addition, the values were greatly increased over baseline. Um, there was no differences, of course, in the normal diet animals as our controls. There was a slight elevation in the high fat diet animals at three and six months. And interestingly, the normal diet PCSK9 gain of function animals did have a slight rise over time. Um, it, and it was a significant difference between six months and baseline. So we did, or were able to induce hypercholesterolemia in our animal groups. One other point I wanted to talk about briefly is that when we calculated the heart rate over those 72 hours, um, there was a, an interesting trend. So these animals are young to start with at three months of age when we uh, started them on study. And over time, their heart rate did decrease, which is a uh, which is well known in that uh, younger animals and it, it also as humans, um, as they age, their heart rate tends to go down. We did see a significant decrease over time in our heart rates um, from baseline to six months. In addition, the normal diet animals wild type group were significantly lower than the other three at six months. For our frequency domain analysis, I want to show you our, some of our results that were quite interesting. On the left, you'll see the high frequency domain, uh, normalized units amongst our groups of animals. What we saw was uh, the, and this is a, an indication of vagal, vagal mediation of the index, it tended to be increased from baseline in the wild type normal group, and that was significant at six months. There was no change in the HF in the other groups in general. However, there was some transient increase in the HF at six months or at three months of age in the PCSK9 gain of function animals in the, on the normal diet. And there was a slight decrease that was significant at six months in the high fat diet group. More interesting is the ratio of the low frequency to the high frequency domain, which is a, a measure of the sympathovagal balance. And that did decrease in all normal diet animals, as you can see in, in the wild type group, as well as the normal diet group of the gain of function. However, what we see is an increase in this ratio in the high fat diet animals that were hyper, had hypercholesterolemia over, way over and above the other three. And that did remain elevated in, in, uh, in the high fat diet animals that were wild type, but there was no change longitudinally. Looking at our time domain analysis data, both of the vaguely mediated indices, TNN50 and RMSSB, did have significant increases from baseline into normal diet animals. But this was suppressed in general in the PCSK9 HFD animals with a slight increase at six months over baseline in three months. That was significant. In our SDNN to RMSSD data in the far right, which is a again a, a an index of sympathovagal balance, the this this ratio tended to decrease over time in all the groups. However, there were significant decreases from baseline only in the normal diet animals, as shown here in general. 
However, there was a slight but significant decrease in the high fat diet gain of function animals at six months. However, this, this ratio was significantly elevated over all the other groups at six months of age. Looking at how the LDL correlated with our time domain data, was what, which is what we were more, much more interested in. When we looked at the um, ratio of SDNN to RMSFD, there is a direct correlation of increased values for the ratio and increasing LDL. And both of the vaguely mediated uh, indices uh, RMSSD alone and PNN50 were inversely correlated to uh, levels of LDL. Correlations with our frequency domain analysis, similar to what we saw in the SFDN to RMSSD uh, balance index, the LF to LH uh, ratio also was directly correlated to LDL values and the normalized High frequency domain was inversely correlated, similar to the other two measures of uh, time domain indexes. And lastly, talking about how time domain and alpha time domain data versus frequency domain data correlate. What was interesting was that there's a direct correlation between those two ratios that was positive and significant, indicating that we were e able to uh, identify uh, uh, that both of those analyses are showing us similar, uh, similar values and similar indications of the balance changing. So in summary, this is one of, to the best of our knowledge, one of the best first studies to prospectively monitor heart rate variability with indices of both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system with respect to hyper developing hypercholesterolemia and longitudinally. We showed that compared to baseline, we did have uh, differences in vaguely mediated HRV in the time domain that were depressed as well as in the frequency domain. In our severely hypercholesterolemic animals, the high fat diet PCSK9 gain of function animals when compared to controls after six months of diet. With respect to baseline, the parasympathovagal mediated HRV time domain indices of SSPN to RMSSD were significantly elevated and the frequency domain LF to HF was also significantly increased in the severely hypercholesterolemic animals when compared to controls. Furthermore, the vaguely mediated HRV indices, PNN50, RMSSD, and HF, both in the time, so that's the time domain and the frequency domain indices, were inversely correlated with our, with uh, LDL. Whereas the balanced mediated HRV indices were directly correlated with LDLC. Oops, sorry. These changes in the, the sympathovagal balance do suggest a combined effect of the increased sympathetic activation and decreased vaguely mediated influences due to hypercholesterolemia. So, in conclusion, I just wanted to summarize that. We've seen some diet-induced hypercholesterolemic reduction in the vagal-mediated HRV and increases in the sympathovagal balance that correlate with uh, sympathetic activation in the frequency domain as well as in the time domain. And that we do see longitudinal in differences between the normal diet and high-fat diet litter mates that does seem to be attributed to cholesterol levels. So we think that in our, at least in our preclinical model here, that cholesterol does have an intrinsic influence on the autonomic dysregulation as measured by heart rate variability.
I just want to make a few acknowledgements. Um, our team is actually a fairly large team. I want to uh, acknowledge a few people. First, our PI, Dr. Lila Lerman, who, who is the head of our lab and make sure that we are well funded. Our research scientist, Dr. Sheng Yang Zhu, who is in charge of and helps with uh, analyzing and, and uh, uh, helps with designing the experiments. James Creer, who is our animal expert, and Chris Ferguson, who helps with all the experiments and the image analysis. And almost all of this data for the time domain and frequency domain analysis was chugged through by our summer student, Domingo Yusida. I also want to make a thank you to the support of Recombinetics and Dr. Daniel Carlson. First question, many physiological measures are uh, influenced by circadian rhythm. Uh, can you speak to any diurnal effects on HRV in your models? And Emma, maybe you could start. Uh, yeah, so we do see a, a huge swing in our heart rate variability parameters uh, between light cycles. Um, we often see an increase in heart rate variability in the daytime, which for rodents is when they're resting because they're nocturnal. So it's a little counterintuitive, but that actually makes a ton of sense because that would be sort of the vagal mediated part of their day. So you would expect to see sort of a greater influence of that, I would believe. Um, and then we see sort of a consistent drop in it. Again, when we do 36 or 48 hours of recordings, we will see this sort of consistent swing up and down. Um, but the data I presented today was just from the dark cycle, but we do see an effect for sure. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, John, yeah, you? So we've looked at briefly have looked at the diurnal cycle of our animals and there seems to be a lot less um, influence in the diurnal cycle on our particular animals and it could simply be due to a couple of things. One, it could be the way our animals are handled and, 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 and housed, but it also could be partially due to the fact that it's well known that uh, animals, specifically ocelots, when they are fed and get large and have um, metabolic syndrome induced uh, from the, our high fat diet, they tend to have a lot less activity and are a lot less active. So we could be seeing a masking of some of that effect uh, due to those animals. Now we do, it, our control animals, we didn't see a lot of difference and it could simply be that we do have some smaller numbers. We only have four animals in our normal diet control group. Um, we're hoping to add a few more animals to that group so that we can uh, look at those particular differences later on. Okay, very good. Um, next question. So uh, you both presented HRV data, um, one derived from ECG traces, the other blood pressure recordings. Uh, Santiago has asked how comparable are results obtained from ECG, you know, versus blood pressure data. So could perhaps we have a discussion about you know your experience ECG versus blood pressure and maybe the experimental advantages or drawbacks of of using these measurements to interpret changes in autonomic function uh, again Emma maybe you could lead us off um sure so you know traditionally um the reason that ECGs are I think preferred is because when you're trying to sort of mark in your waveforms, uh, you get the sharpest peak with your uh, R wave compared to something like a systolic peak of your uh, blood pressure form. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you absolutely can mathematically derive these from either. Um, I think it becomes sort of a, a concern of how precisely you're sort of capturing the same component of the heart's activity, um, which when you have the heart reflection in ECG is a little more clear than you have in sort of a, um, indirect measurement of the heart function, which you would get in blood pressure. But um, so I, I understand people use blood pressure and it is published because people want to obtain as much useful data from their you know recordings as possible. Um, so I think sort of physiological purists would say if you can, you should derive them from ECGs or at least corroborate, you know, them with ECGs with your blood pressure to sort of know how consistent they are. But um, absolutely, you can, you can mathematically derive them from blood pressure. Okay. John, any uh, additions there? Uh, I would agree. I'm, I'm going to agree with uh, Emma completely on that. I think I, uh, you can do that. It is best to have ECG. Um, we're trying to utilize, and 
she is also correct in that we are trying to utilize as much of our data as we can. Um, and uh, we wanted to at least attempt the, the analysis. But what I would also say is that seeing the agreement between the two types of analysis also suggests that you know that our data is actually reasonably uh, reflective of what's going on. It's not the best. I agree. Okay. Very good. Um, Emma, did your lab test any other beat to beat percent change values other than the twenty percent you discussed? Um, we did. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead and answer that part first, and then I'll continue it with another. Uh, uh, sure. So we we started with a, a 50% because we had when we were doing some initial arrhythmia detection analysis. We um, when we assign missed beats, we look for 100% of a change between um, two beats as a reflection of an entire missed beat or a dropped beat, um, and then we use a 50% cutoff um, as sort of a one and a half missed beat, so the hardest sort of functioning abnormally. Um, and so we started from there and just went down. We did 50, we did 40, 30. 35, we were playing around, we looked at a bunch of um, histograms to look at the distribution of our of our data across multiple animals to try and say like, how close are we getting? And so we, we started at where I think we agreed on 35 for a while and we felt pretty good about that. And then as our hand cleaned um, data came in, and again, the problem is, you know, comparing an hour, if you have a relatively clean hour, of data that you're comparing to 35, you may find that that's completely acceptable. Um, but as you sort of get a broader range of fidelity of data coming in cleaned up, you have to make changes. And we found that really 20% eliminated, and it's a, it's a, do you want to eliminate all of the bad data and a little bit of the good, or do you want to keep a little bit of the bad data and mostly, and, and not eliminate any good? And so that's sort of the, the line you have to, figure out okay. um, and we we decided that 20 may be you know it may be 21 is perfect it might be 18 is perfect I mean there's no way that we can truly know that um, but we we found that enough consistency across a couple of animals and both in mice and rats we found that consistency where we felt confident that we were eliminating enough bad data that we were getting to a true real physiological value okay um, very good. Um, it, somewhat as an extension of this, Chris has asked, uh, have you specifically tested uh, that 20% cutoff uh, to the effects or sens effect sensitivity to detect slight increases in vagal tone? I don't know that I understand that question. Um, I'll repeat it. How Have you tested how your 20% cutoff affects sensitivity to detect slight increases in vagal tone? So I think it is talking to that, um, you know, d does it reduce your ability to see um, small changes? Um, uh, I see. Okay. Um, I, I would say we actually get better resolution. We were using that two standard deviation cutoff and we could see some modest changes in vagal tone. And I think this has actually cleaned up our data so that we have a very small effect size in our mouse model as is. I'm, I'm talking maybe one to three milliseconds. So, you know, any sort of artifact or noise is going to potentially interfere with that enough that, you know, our, with our statistics, we're not going to get be able to detect anything. Um, so we actually found better resolution with this 20% cutoff in the same data set compared to the two standard deviations. So we actually feel really confident that we are, we are capturing changes in vagal tone appropriately. Very good. Okay. Um, John, what software program did you use to obtain the low frequency and high frequency domains? Um, we just used the um, embedded uh, Panema, uh, analysis within Panema. Um, we were able to um, uh, identify and utilize that software directly. Okay. Um, maybe Terrence and, and Jennifer, could you comment on this extension? How is there any improvement of workflow that Data Insights provides um, for that type of analysis? Hi, so this is Jennifer Doyle, and I guess um, to your question, so as Emma Carey had provided in her presentation, uh, Data Insights allows the user to remove the um, artifacts that can show up in an ECG signal, uh, arrhythmias that are not driven by the SA node, um, and which takes away from your true HRV um, findings, 
So Data Insights allows you to use that as a tool to remove anything that should be removed without having to hand score or hand clean up the data. Okay, so then would data be moving back into Ponema or are data sets moving oh, back between these two yeah. things for analysis? I, so, I think that's the question. Yeah, great question, to Andy. That's I forgot to mention that. So Data Insights is um, a program that's within Ponema. So you interact with Data Insights along with your your data stream of the ECG signal. So you can live look at the findings and then go back to the series of beats that um, were involved in your findings. Perfect. Okay. So it's, all, it's all interactive in Panama. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. Let's talk about, uh, and I know we're a little bit over time, but a lot of good questions are coming in, so we're just going to keep this going. Um, <clears throat> it is, is it always the case that continuous recording should be analyzed for HRV, or can parse data sets be used to draw the same scientific conclusions? I mean, we've John, you mentioned five-minute intervals analysis in your pigs. Uh, can you explain this process again and why your lab analyzed the data this way? And maybe following Emma, can you comment on parsing data samples in a in a rodent model? Uh, um, I, I, so we yeah we did do continuous con uh, continuous acquisition over the entire uh, six months those animals were on uh, study. Um, we, we broke it up into the five minute interval, similar to the reason why uh, Emma did for the at short term analysis to calculate the, uh, those values for the time domain. Um, but we did do, do use the, the continuous, uh, the entire 72 hours parsed out that way. Okay. Um, it also made it a little bit easier to handle the data, I think. We now, we do do and have utilized um, non-continuous data acquisition, we are, which we are actually currently act, uh, looking at in a several other groups of animals. Okay. Um, um, okay, so like I said, uh, you get different information when you do uh, parsed segments, and so I know that it is uh, more common, I think, to do parsed segments in frequency domain, at least as far as where I've seen it done. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for this is, again, you can sort of find a clean section of data within an hour, for example. You can find 30 seconds or a minute and say, okay, I'm going to use this as my reflective of the whole hour, and then I'll just go on and, and from there. And I think that the danger in that potentially is that you are cherry picking. So is it clean because the animal is just not moving and so you know especially in rodents you have this challenge where like you have the lead configuration and as they bend and groom and eat and move around they're constantly adjusting their leads which is why you have really noisy signals often um it's a little less of a problem in rats but mice it's a, a huge problem and so are you picking a segment where they're resting and so you have maybe a greater vagal influence in that one minute and then maybe if you had looked at the next minute over, even that's a little bit messier, that would reflect something totally different. And so I think that as a scientist, I am hesitant to say, don't look at all the data because I think that all of the data informs you in ways that cherry picking certain sections will, you'll miss something. Mm -hmm. And you'll make totally different conclusions from that because you just don't have all of the information. And so um, I think if you have the ability, you, you generally I've seen heart variability um, you know, in humans, again, you can do shorter time segments because you are controlling their respiration. They are seated and stationary. Um, but for rodents, I, I really think the more data you have, the more of a picture of sort of the autonomic regulation you are able to get. And so I think it, it, it you're, you're hurting your own uh, sort of conclusions by, by not including as much data as you have. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Um... Dr. Bob Hamlin is, is sending in lots of questions. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Hamlin. Um, ha Emma, how did you produce the arrhythmias, arrhythmias in the um, data that you presented today? Okay, so I actually wasn't a part of that study. Um, that was in collaboration with a, a lab we work with on campus. Um, and I'm not entirely familiar with that pacing protocol. That data is published, and I am happy to, to find that citation in that paper and send that PDF over to him. Um, but I... That was prior to me getting here, so I actually have never performed that procedure myself. 